Meet the World War II experts who work on the battlefield. This is the Bunker Boys Show with your host, Tony Cisneros. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bunker Boys Show. If you are even remotely into World War II, this is the show for you. We have a fantastic episode today. We'll be talking to my friend David Harper of Eagle's Nest Historical Tours. He lives down in the beautiful village of Berchtesgaden down in Bavaria, Southeast Germany. And he'll be talking to us today about the Obersalzburg. That's the Upper Salt Mountain. That mountain area, just about 2,000 feet higher than the village of Berchtesgaden, was used by Hitler in the 1920s as sort of a base of operations. And in the 1930s, it was used as a second seat of power for the Third Reich, for the Hitler regime. So it developed and expanded into quite a large compound, uh, many buildings and lots of people working there. Of course, also home to the Eagle's Nest which was the mountaintop conference center that uh, Hitler actually didn't visit very many times, uh, probably about a dozen times. But uh, nonetheless, that is one of the only buildings that remains today from that compound uh, up on top of the Kelstein Mountain, up above the Obersalzburg area. So we'll be breaking it all down for you uh, with David today. We'd like you to join us also in two weeks on July 22nd, with uh, co-host Reg Jans. Reg will be joining us and talking about uh, the town of Baston in Belgium during the Battle of the, of the Bulge. Uh, during the Bulge, of course, the focus of the battle shifted uh, to becoming a fight for that city, which was an important crossroads. And uh, the city was cut off by the Germans and uh, became quite a desperate situation for those American soldiers, in particular paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division that were holding the line there and uh, preventing the town from, from being overrun by uh, German armored units. So uh, good stuff coming up. We hope you'll join us then. That's uh, July 22nd for Episode 6 with co-host Reg Jans. Since we started this show about three months ago, it appears that the world has been turned upside down. Everyone has gone completely mad. The topic of the day, of course, is racism, and I just have a few words to say about that. History shows us that racists end up on the losing side. We've had wars about this. I mean, have we not learned anything in the last 75 years? Well, the master racist of this century was Adolf Hitler. And his hatred of the Jews started as just a small seed, but that seed grew over time with the help of other racists and also occultists who groomed Hitler. People like Guido von Liszt, Lanz von Liebefels, Karl Luger, Dietrich Eckhart, Alfred Rosenberg, just to name a few of these other anti-Semitic racist people who uh, helped influence Hitler's hatred of the Jews. Racism uses two of the most volatile and dangerous emotions we have, and that is fear and hate. And when these two emotions are used connected, combined with each other, the results can be devastating. The results can be deadly. So America, be smart out there and let's learn from the lessons of history. Let's not tear down the lessons of history and throw them away. Let's learn from the lessons of history. We're going to start now with David Harper. Let's talk about the Obersalzburg and why Hitler came to that area, what brought him to the area, what kept him there, and how the Obersalzburg became so important to Hitler. It was actually where he said he made all of his best decisions, all the most important decisions Hitler ever made. He attributed to the area near Berchtesgaden, the Obersalzburg. So let's be joined now by David Harper in Berchtesgaden. 
David Harper, I'm so uh, thrilled to talk to you today. This is very, very special to me uh, because I, I'm not sure how many of our viewers know, but uh, I used to work for you uh, in Berchtesgaden as a tour guide. It's where I got my start in the tourist uh, industry. And um, this is very, very special for me to, to talk to you. So thank you so much for being here, David. It's great to be here. It's great to see you, Tony. We go back a long, long ways, actually. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking the other day, that book that you illustrated so beautifully, that was that first guidebook on Berchtesgaden, that was back in 95 that it was published. So that just shows how long we've known each other, That's over right. a quarter of a century. A really long time, amazing. And it's amazing how fast uh, time has gone, you know. Um, it so has. Let's let's tell people where you live, and uh, this is such a um, beautiful, beautiful place, Berchtesgaden. Can you tell uh, our viewers just a little bit about where it is and and what what that area is like? Berchtesgaden is in the southeast of Germany, more precisely in Bavaria. It's very close to Salzburg, just over the border in Austria. And people have been coming to Berchtesgaden for a long time. It was chosen by the kings of Bavaria as a summer home. It became one of their seats of power, in fact, and really paved the way for uh, a lot of visitors to come here from all over Europe. And uh, among the places that they visited is a sub-district of Berchtesgaden called Obersalzburg, and that's where Hitler eventually decided to make his home. People come here because of the beauty of the mountains. They come here because of the lake called Königsee, the salt mines. And nowadays they come for a new site, and that is the Eagle's Nest. And uh, what brought you to Berchtesgaden, David, and, and your wife, Christine? I started off my life in the States. Um, but at the age of five, I was moved to France. So I grew up there back and forth again across the big puddle. And eventually, well, a little over 34, I guess 34 years ago, um, I moved to Berthesca and worked for the US Armed Forces as a tour guide. That was when I wasn't teaching in Vienna. I was teaching languages in Vienna. And on one of the uh, summer uh, teaching programs here in uh, giving the educational tours in Berchtesgaden for the U.S. Armed Forces, I met my lovely then future wife, Christine, who's from Montana. And in 1990, we decided to start our own company, Eagle's Nest Historical Tours, and we've been giving and developing these tours ever since. And I, I want to talk to you more about those tours uh, here in a little bit, but... Um you also have a spy in the family, right? Uh, from World War II, uh, a direct connection with someone who uh, actually served in the SOE, is that right? That's correct, yes. My Aunt Noor, she, she had a very unusual background. Her mother came from the United States, but her father came from India. He was a musician, he was a mystic, he was a philosopher. And Noor grew up in London to start with, and at the age of seven, they moved to just outside of Paris, a little town called Seren. And she became a musician, a writer, a poet. But when Germany took over France in 1940, the family fled. They actually had British passports, including my mother. And so they all wanted to somehow contribute to the war effort from England. And my aunt Noor decided to train as a radio operator. She joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the WAF, and became a radio transmitter, which was very much needed in those days for communication, gaining intelligence, and for trying to coordinate all kinds of missions on the ground. Eventually, because she was bilingual, she spoke French and English just as well, uh, one and the other. She was then recruited by SOE, Churchill's baby, uh, for setting Europe ablaze and training recruits uh, behind enemy lines like in France and elsewhere. And so they used her to continue her training as not only a radio operator for communication purposes, but also as an agent, learning to fight and learning what to do if you were in enemy territory. This was a, a new idea of Churchill's uh, to send, possibly send women to battle 
behind enemy lines, a little bit risky because as a civilian, uh, not working, not being sent over, deployed as a member of the British Armed Forces, but as a civilian, if that person were caught, if, for instance, my aunt had been caught, she would not come under the agreements of the Geneva Convention, whereby then she would be treated with a certain amount of dignity and respect or, or uh, in a humane way. So it was very risky, this idea of sending women to, uh, to foreign territory like that behind enemy lines. That's exactly what happened to her. She was then sent to France um, in 1943, to join a network of resistance, mainly French as well as British resistance, um, in Paris. And there she was to serve as a radio operator. But unfortunately, just a couple of days after her arrival in France, under a code name, she was called Madeleine, and she had a whole new French identity, uh, the entire network was infiltrated and the Gestapo arrested everybody except for my aunt. She just only stumbled into this huge uh, mess, basically, for, for England, for the SOE. And she was urged by her superiors back in London to return to England, but she refused. She said no, she needed to accomplish her mission and do her job. And so she stayed on to try and reorganize a network. And for a long time, she was the only link, radio link between Paris and all the resistance movements in France and the headquarters in London of SOE. So she played a very important role there and risked, of course, the entire time she was very, very high risk of being caught. The Germans had these vans, detection vans. As soon as she started radioing back to England, they intercepted. They knew that a radio was in operation and within a few minutes they could try to home in on where that those messages were being sent from. They said that the life expectancy of a radio operator that was the most dangerous of the agent's operations uh, on foreign territory was approximately three weeks. She ended up spending, spending three months or more even in France and always refused to go back to England, which made her, of course, look very heroic and they already wanted her to uh, to receive medals and awards for her bravery. Unfortunately, um, after these weeks and weeks had gone by of changing her safe house and changing her appearance, dyeing her hair, the real spy-like adventures, uh, she was betrayed by somebody who knew the organization. And she was arrested by the Gestapo and she was then taken to the Gestapo headquarters in Paris where she was given pretty good treatment. It was a, a sort of a luxury prison, that the seven cells of the, of the security headquarters in Paris for, for agents like her. And they tried to gain information from her by befriending her rather than torture. Torture, of course, was used on others, but luckily at that point, not on my aunt. She refused, and in fact, she tried to escape twice. The second attempt to escape is quite a story with a couple of other civil, uh, friends of hers whom she contacted then or communicated with with Morse code through the walls. They set up a plan to leave, and it was by using a stolen screwdriver that one of the, one of the inmates uh, had managed to secure and to loosen the bars of their skylight above each of these uh, cells was a skylight looking up onto the roof. And they managed over a period of weeks then to loosen those bars, always hiding the evidence of the holes they were making around the bars by stuffing in some kneaded, some bread, you know, the bread that they, they kneaded it into a ball and then stuffed it in there. And with Noor's makeup and um, uh, powder, etc., cetera, they, they concealed it, making it look like it was just the plaster on the wall. And after all this preparation, they managed to finally escape middle of the night onto the roof of this um, headquarters in Paris. Unfortunately for them, they did not make it to safety. It was a Royal Air Force air raid that created then 
uh, that set off the sirens uh, over Paris. An air raid was about to happen, come in. And when that takes place, then the prisoners' cells are always checked by the guards. Um, it was just one of these regulations. And so the whole area was surrounded and uh, they were caught before they managed to make their escape. The head of security at the headquarters there said to, to Noor and her two um, fellow escapees, you need to give your word of honor that you will not try to escape again and you can stay here. If you can't give your word of honor, then you're gonna be sent to Germany. Well, one of them said, yes, I promise not to escape again, but Noor and the other man, the French resistance um, said, no, they could not do that because it was their right to try to escape. And so they were sent to Germany. Uh, actually, my aunt Noor was the very first woman agent, female agent who was sent to Germany as a prisoner. And for close to a year, she was in solitary confinement in, uh, in a prison in Pforzheim, where she was shackled, hands and feet. And another amazing story, uh, there were three French agents who were in a cell at the end of the corridor. And they always wondered about this girl who was all alone, was never taken out, who cried a lot at night, and who was mistreated. She was often beaten up. And um, they started then to communicate with her by scratching messages underneath the tin plates and the tin mugs that were used in the prison. And she finally one day saw this message under a tin plate, we are three French agents. And communication then continued over a period of months so that she was able to, communi to communicate to them who she was, where she was from, and to ask them if they ever got out to tell her mother um, that she was okay. Um, she even wrote the address so that after the war, it just so happened that one of those girls was able to return home. And the only way we know that my Aunt Noor was ever in that prison is because she communicated then with Noor's mother after the war. Uh, she disappeared from Paris in this Nacht and Nebel condition, NNN, -N, which means um, fog, night and fog, basically, so that family members of the person who disappears never know happened to that person. In other words, no information given out about what happened to the person making their disappearance much more painful to family members. Unfortunately, um, this was now three months after D-Day. Uh, Hitler decided that all of the various agents who had worked against the Third Reich and the German armed forces should be, if possible, put to death. So she was removed from the prison in Pforzheim and joined three other SOE prisoners um, who were women agents, and they, all four of them, were put on a train and sent to the infamous Dachau concentration camp where they were all four executed. A lot has been written about her, several biographies. There's a brand new biography called Codename Madeline that just came out not long ago in the States a couple of documentaries, one made by the BBC in Britain called uh, Princess Spy, and another one um, in the States um, called Enemy of the Reich. So she's been receiving posthumously uh, a lot of recognition, which is nice to know. Well, like I say, she was an amazing person, and I'm so glad that she's getting this type of recognition for, for everything that she did, and, and even more so because it's bringing attention to the fact that women like your aunt were involved in this conflict and, and not just doing, you know, Rosie the Riveter type stuff, but they were actually involved in combat missions. So uh, it's an incredible story and I'd love to hear more about that. Maybe we can do an episode sometime just on your aunt Noor. But let's talk about the Obersalzburg now. Um, you had mentioned that 
this area just on the outskirts of Berchtesgaden was where Adolf Hitler came uh, in the early 1920s and set up his southern headquarters there. But can you tell our viewers a little bit about what brought Hitler to that area and why he stayed there, um, why the Obersalzburg became so important for Hitler and the Third Reich uh, in the 1930s? Absolutely. Today, if one thinks about Hitler in the Alps, we think immediately Eagle's Nest, and a lot of people think that that's where he lived. But as you rightly said, Ober Salzburg was the place. Uh, 1923, Hitler was at that point uh, already speaking a lot in public. He was already the head of the party. Uh, a party that had been founded much earlier, actually even before his involvement, and he became a member of that party in Munich. And one of the key, um, one of the early members of the party was a man called Dietrich Eckhart. It was Eckhart who invited Hitler to Ober Salzburg, above Berchtesgaden. Eckhart was a writer. He had an anti-Semitic newsletter called Auf Gut Deutsch, in good German. He was often uh, at odds with the German police and the German government. He had insulted the, the Reich's president and was wanted um, by the police. He, um, his attacks uh, against the Jews in Germany uh, in the form of his newsletter uh, were the police wanted to get him for that, wanted him to, to come to, to justice, but he always managed to slip away. And while he was hanging out, while he was lying low, shall we say, uh, in a small hotel at Ober Salzburg, he decided to invite his friend Adolf Hitler to come and join him here. He'd met Hitler in the early days, just after World War I, it was 1919 in Munich, he heard Hitler speak at a small gathering, and this man Eckhart felt that this was the man that Germany needed. Eckhart was involved in, though not a member of, the Tula Society, which I know you're familiar with, and this uh, group of people who wanted to uh, explore the ancient roots of the German people, uh, the German race, so to speak, um, was also, they also studied the occult. And one of the symbols that they used was actually the swastika. Um, it suggests, it's been suggested that Eckhart was the one who suggested to Hitler the use of the swastika, which is a very ancient symbol. It's been used around the world, actually, for thousands of years and always in a very positive way. Um, Eckhart also felt that Hitler was a kind of messiah. He, he, he'd already written a poem before meeting Hitler about the great one who was about to come and help Germany in its time of need, in its dark hours, uh, due to the, to the, let's say, the sanctions, the very harsh sanctions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles that Germany was suffering from, and this Messiah would somehow help the German people in their hour of need. So he promoted Hitler a lot. He became a mentor to Hitler. He helped him with his speeches in public. He, uh, they discussed the ideology of this future, uh, of this future regime, uh, which then changed from the DAP, the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or German Workers' Party, to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, known in Germany as the National Socialist Party. So, at Ober Salzburg, Hitler now visiting his friend Eckhart, uh, they planned and plotted together for several weeks. And one of the ideas was that the party they felt was now strong enough to take over, to simply um, stage a putsch, first of all in Munich, later in, in Berlin was the idea. And so that famous beer hall putsch that was a failed attempt to seize power in 1923, was actually instigated uh, to a greater extent by Dietrich Eckhart. He was part of that, 
And just like Hitler, because of this failed attempt, they were both imprisoned. However, due to his ill health, Dietrich Eckhart was released very shortly thereafter, and he returned to Berchtesgaden where he suffered a heart attack and was then buried in the cemetery in Berchtesgaden. So people didn't really hear much about him, though he played a fundamental role in the party's early beginnings and in steering Hitler in a certain direction for his future role in Germany. Uh, as far as Mein Kampf goes, um, we all know that Hitler started dictating that. He didn't actually, actually write it himself. He dictated it uh, in prison, in Landsberg prison, during the short stay there, only eight months that he served there, his five-year prison sentence. He was released on grounds of good behavior, provided he didn't appear in public for two years. And during that time, then, he returned immediately after his prison stay in Landsberg, he returned to Berchtesgaden, even though Dietrich Eckhart was no longer alive. He used it as a base. And there he then dictated the second part of his book. If you uh, look at the old copies of Mein Kampf, one sees that there's a part one and a part two. And indeed, he dedicated that to his friend and mentor, Dietrich Eckhart. He created a hospital in Berchtesgaden named after him. And like you said, many places were named after him. So he was a name uh, that people in Germany at that time were accustomed to hearing. But since then, let's say today, historians hardly ever talk about Dietrich Eckhart. So what happened next then? In, in the 1920s, once Hitler is released from Landsberg prison after the failed Beer Hall Putsch, uh, you said he came back to, to Berchtesgaden, to the Obersalzburg, um, and uh, he made that his home, right? So um, tell us a little bit about the, the house that he uh, uh, rented and, and then purchased there and how that turned into mm -hmm. this massive uh, mansion he had. Absolutely, yes. Uh, after basing himself at a, the guest house, the little hotel where he had been active with Dietrich Eckhart for some time, he found that there was a, a home for rent. Um, it had a name, House Wachenfeld was called. It had the advantage of facing Austria in the distance, his homeland, the homeland that he'd slammed it, the door behind him uh, from in earlier years. But um, the disadvantage is it was the north side of the mountain. It didn't really provide much sunlight, but he was a night person and it didn't seem to bother him. So he had his half-sister come in from, uh, from Vienna with her two daughters and keep house for him. That continued on all the way through uh, into 1935. And that became a home that was well photographed. By this time, 1928, Hitler wanted uh, as much spotlight attention as possible. His party was becoming more and more um, famous. And it was very practical for him to be associated with a famous place in Germany. Everybody knew Berchtesgaden. It was the home of the kings of Bavaria. And so this really helped create roots for this Austrian, who was stateless for quite some time. He was only awarded German citizenship just months before he came to power in 1933. And give him uh, the credibility that he, as a former foreigner in Austria, an Austrian did not possess. It was also marketed in a way of presenting Hitler as not just at home, they called it his chosen home or his chosen homeland, but also the place where this gentleman farmer, if you like, was close to the people. A lot of propaganda photographs were taken there, especially by his chief photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann from Munich, in which Hitler was depicted as a kindly man, simple, dressed very often in civilian clothing rather than a military getup, um, talking to elderly people, to children, uh, petting dogs, uh, the, the nice man, you know, somebody who was more approachable there as opposed to when he was campaigning, he was more lofty and stern and serious. 
there in Berchtesgaden, he could smile for the photographers and these uh, booklets were created by Hoffman over the years, especially once Hitler had come to power, uh, this never changed. Uh, they continued then focusing on Hitler as being at home. One of the booklets was called Hitler in his mountains. So no mention of Austria, of course, but there he was pictured at ease, comfortable at his home with his buddies who also lived on the mountain, uh, Goering and Hess and Speer and Bormann and all of these people then who surrounded him there were just the best of friends having a good time and close to the people. People came from all over Germany, already starting in the 1920s, before the Führer became the Chancellor of Germany, people wanted to see where this possible future leader uh, lived. And because so much publicity was made about it, sometimes they had as many as 5,000 visitors in one day. Um, this again was used by the propaganda, by the press at the time, to show Hitler as being one of the people, close to the people, communicating with the people. Hitler liked it because it gave him a kind of star quality that he needed in publicizing himself and the party. It was also a way of distancing himself from his homeland. He didn't like Austria once he left it and never really had anything good to say about Austria. So he tried over the years to wean his accent away from the Austrian dialect that he had as a young person to then take on a Bavarian dialect. Uh, he described it himself as a lower Bavarian way of speaking, lower Bavarian dialect. Uh, he was so much focused on his appearance, the way he presented himself in public, that he went through series of photographs that he could look at himself to see how he should, uh, what kind of gestures he should make, what kind of facial expressions he should have when talking to the crowds. And the same thing with his elocution. He took elocution training in Munich with a very famous opera singer and actor to assumedly try to sound more like a Bavarian than an Austrian. And this, of course, in turn, would be more acceptable to the German people as a whole. Oh, this man, he lives down in Berchtesgaden at Obersalzburg. Now, obviously, the way he speaks corresponds to that image. So all of this Obersalzburg connection in the early days was image making. That, that area, I mean, we often see this footage of, of Hitler on the terrace of his house, you know, with, like you say, in civilian clothes, just enjoying the view of the mountains. You know, how much time really did he spend there? We often hear that this was just a holiday resort for Hitler, that, you know, he just spent weekends there once in a while when the weather was nice. But it was much more significant and important, wasn't it, the whole area as it developed? Yes, Tony, you're absolutely right. Again, we have so many, there's so many myths about Hitler and Berchtesgaden. And a lot of this is confusing because usually people think about, oh, Eagle's Nest, and then we hear, oh, Hitler was hardly up at the Eagle's Nest at all. But of course, we're not talking about the Eagle's Nest. We're talking about Ober Salzburg, where his home actually stood. Earlier on, we talked about the place he rented in 1928, Haus Wachenfeld. By the time he had seized power in 1933, Hitler was a millionaire through the sale of his book, Mein Kampf. He decided then to buy the home he'd been renting. And with two phases of reconstruction, they kept the old core of the building, but now transformed it into a 30 room mansion, a huge estate that was inaugurated in 1936. They gave it a new name. It was called the Berghof, as we mentioned before, which means mountain farm or mountain estate. And this was famous for a couple of very distinct features. This was then the original home 
that he rented. And after the reconstruction, it looked like this, a very, very large building with eight bedrooms. It was particularly well known for its window. The window was about 26 feet long, almost 14 feet in height, and looked out towards Austria in the distance. The other distinguishing feature was a huge terrace that has been over the years shown so often in old film clips and footage from then. That home was indeed used a lot more often than people realize today. If you try to take the average during the just during the time that he was in power, those 12 years of this reign of terror of Adolf Hitler, we can safely say that he was there a third of that time. Throughout the year, whenever he could come to Berchtesgaden to go up to Obersalzburg above the town of Berchtesgaden, he did. It was a couple of weeks here, or a few days there, or sometimes months on end. Over the years, between the time that he started renting that place and the time that he committed suicide, it was actually there that he spent more time than in any one other place in his life. A lot of very important decisions were made right there. People don't realize that it really led uh, the world into a Second World War. If you place, if you look back and see exactly what was going on there, you understand that step one was the takeover of Austria, the annexation of Austria in 1938. Actually, Hitler had uh, invited, summoned, really, um, Schuschnigg, the uh, chancellor of Austria, to his home and bullied him into trying to join forces with Germany. And when that didn't work out, then he just gave orders from that same home at the Ober Salzburg to annex Austria. Step two was then a meeting with uh, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, on September 15th of that same year, 1938, that again took place at the Berghof, where they discussed the possibilities of cooperating to avoid uh, another world war. Peace in our time was the famous slogan that Chamberlain came back home with. And this was in preparation for the agreement that was signed in Munich a couple of weeks later handing the Sudetenland and eventually Czechoslovakia to, to Hitler and the Germans. Uh, step three was a very detailed preparation that Hitler made at his home, informing his generals in, in the summer of 1939 that they were going to go to war and that Poland was going to be uh, beaten to a pulp, practically. Uh, at least this is what he intimated. And uh, that then eventually led to the invasion of Poland, which sparked off World War II. You could say that World War II was set in motion. The wheels of World War II were set in motion at the Berghof. Uh, step four was the, uh, the Eastern Front, the invasion of uh, Russia. And again, this was planned in great detail at Hitler's home, the Berghof. So apart from being just a home, it was also a very important military headquarters that led to devastation in more than just Germany, uh, but everywhere in the world. So what, what happened to his house, uh, David? I mean, obviously it's not there anymore. Um, can you tell us uh, what, what happened to it? Not much is left, that's true. A very large air raid took place in uh, April of 1945, pretty close to the end of the war. This is on April 25th. Um, about um, close to 400 British planes came and dropped uh, 1,232 tons of bombs at Obersalzburg. And that was uh, uh, quite a beating that Obersalzburg sustained at that time. Most uh, everybody who was living there, and this is a huge compound, Obersalzburg over the years, had grown into a compound of 90 buildings with uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people there. There were some 800 members of the SS living up there. 
a lot of people working on administration, a lot of people working on the maintenance of the southern headquarters. It was a completely off-limit zone. It was the Führersperrgebiet, in other words, an off-limits area of the Führer. And this whole area was pounded then for about an hour and a half on that bright spring day by the British. Hitler's home had um, a couple of hits and just stood as an empty shell then after that time. When the Allied troops arrived, the um, 101st Airborne Division, for instance, arriving um, on the on the site, they, they saw that Hitler's home was um, in very bad shape, not only because of the air raid, but also because the SS were asked to burn down the, the, the place so that nobody could, could pilfer it, nobody could pillage it after the war. That was the, the idea. And then years went by until they thought it would be a better idea to destroy the um, home completely than to leave it standing so that possible sympathizers uh, wouldn't come to that site and worship um, the National Socialist past that obviously still dwelt there. In 1952, it was blown up and bulldozed away. It's hard for um, some people to come to terms with that time period, but I think they've been doing a pretty good job uh, recently in Germany with the opening of a lot of uh, documentation centers, they call them, uh, generally in places uh, that are connected to the perpetrators of uh, of the National Socialist regime. Um, as far as Ober Salzburg goes, yes, you're right. There's the Eagle's Nest that still stands today, as well as a few other buildings that are still there, like Albert Speer's home, for instance, or Hotel Turken, that was the uh, security headquarters at Ober Salzburg during his first time there. Uh, especially interesting is the documentation center, which takes a closer look at the entire picture of Hitler's rise to power and the terror and misery that it brought with it, as well as the center gives access to an interesting part of the four mile underground bunker system below Ober Salzburg. And during that air raid, that's where uh, over a thousand people were hiding away, uh, protected then from the Royal Air Force bombing. So um, a little bit about your tours. How much of this stuff can people see when they go on a tour with you? Some tours uh, take our guests to the site where world history was made, which is Hitler's former home, the Berghof. There's still the retaining wall that one sees at the back of that property. And one can make out how large and imposing that building was. But I think more important is to remember what this dictator actually did there, the thoughts he had there, uh, this source of inspiration that he mentioned, what it led to. Um, racial segregation, uh, Holocaust plans, all of these uh, absolutely devastating sides to Hitler's regime can be traced back to that location as well. So we talk about that apart from uh, the social uh, aspects of that home with the, the terrorists and the uh, high society events that took place there with Ava Brown often hosting uh, these private meetings there. Uh, one also then, then sees the underground bunker system as well as the eagle's nest. Uh, it's uh, on the top of a 6,000 foot high peak, as you well know, absolutely stunning views if you're lucky to have a clear day, but also an amazing feat of engineering, at least it was considered to be such uh, at the time. And perhaps a symbol of Hitler's power in many ways because it dominates the valleys of Berchtesgaden from a perched position in the same way as Hitler viewed himself as being at the very top of a kind of pyramid, a triangle. But it can be visited today. A lot of people do visit it today. You take a special mountain bus up there, followed by a ride in an elevator. Once you're up there, you can see the various rooms that were used for meetings. 
that were used for entertaining diplomats at the time or people who were high up in Hitler's regime at the time. Ava Brown went up there who knows how many times just on her own or to entertain. And it is a really unusual place, not just because of its history, but because of the position uh, in the Berchtesgaden Alps. And, and there's no museum up at the Eagle's Nest. Why, why is that? When it was opened in 1952, three requirements had to be met. One was that people would not talk about that time period. It had to be completely anonymous, just another uh, guest house that you can visit, not after a long hike, as is usually the case in the Berchtesgaden Alps, but with a bus ride and elevator ride. Um, another condition was that it um, they should use the profit for charity, and the third condition was that they destroy the ruins of Hitler's home uh, so that the eagle's nest could be then uh, monitored in a way as far as the visitors go to make sure that it wasn't going to attract hosts of neo-Nazis or visitors uh, of, of, of that kind. Um, so it was only in more recent years that the Institute for Contemporary History that put the museum together at Ober Salzburg, the documentation center, they now have a small exhibition up at the Eagle's Nest in the outside um, covered terrace that talks about its construction and its use. But up until then, really nothing was mentioned. Um, I think it was um, for fear of people connecting it to Hitler or just simply being ashamed of that history. Yeah. There's, there's a fine line, isn't there? I mean, I've always said there's a fine line between glorification and education because, uh, you know, you want people to know about this stuff and we want people to learn about this stuff. But at the same time, we don't want to just do away with it and pretend it didn't happen because uh, history can very easily repeat itself and we need to learn. We need to learn from it and not just tear it down. Uh, at least that's, that's my opinion. But uh, so David, you're uh, absolutely right. You've, you've written a book and I understand you're writing another one. Um, so tell us a, a little bit that's about your new, yes. your new book project and, and the complete guide to Berkta's God. The complete guide which uh, in which you participated with your wonderful drawings <laughs> uh, has been published. It's been re-edited uh, a couple of times. And uh, in addition to that guidebook that really covers the history of the Eagle's Nest and over Salzburg and the things we've been discussing, it goes into the history and the sites of Berskan itself, which is a very unusual region. It's a wonderful place to visit and to live. I must say I feel very privileged to live here. Uh, the new book uh, has a somewhat wider, larger scope of visiting for those who'd like to visit or know more about sites that are connected not to World War II. This is not yet another book about World War II or battles, but rather about the Third Reich as an entity, as a regime, and Hitler um, as the person who conducted that whole operation of stunning Germany and hypnotizing Germany to try to understand where it all came from. It's a book about sites going to places that are either known, like Nuremberg, or some unknown places in Germany for educational purposes, just to try to understand more about the Third Reich in different aspects that are not so widely discussed. And at the same time, to try to explain uh, what happened in Germany, to try to answer questions that I've heard for over 30 years of so many customers asking simple questions about the German people. How, if, why they followed Hitler what did they hope to achieve? Did they condone what happened? How involved were the Germans as a whole? And these are questions that are very difficult to answer. And I'm hoping through this book that 
with the insights that I'm hoping to share uh, in this study um, presently, that people will understand just a little bit more about how easy it is to be blinded by uh, a dictator um, if the timing is right. Amen. It's, uh, it, I, I would love to have you um, back on for an episode just to talk about that book. And, and uh, once you um, have that in the can, let's, um, let's, let's talk about that more because I'm, I'm super interested in, in seeing that. So um, great work, David. I mean, wow, another book already and uh, all these tours. I'm, I'm wishing you all the best for the, for the rest of the season here. I know that um, you've been, you know, as affected as we all have uh, with, the, uh, with the coronavirus and, and uh, tourism being, you know, coming to a halt. But I hope that changes quickly for you guys uh, there in beautiful Berchtesgaden. And um, I can't wait to have you on again. This is this is great. This is a great start. Our first episode together. It would be a pleasure to be on again. And yes, I would just like to thank you, Tony. You're doing fantastic work. It's great to see uh, the people and hear the people that you're interviewing. It's uh, it's very enriching to me as well. So thanks for the good good work. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, as always, you are and continue to be a, an inspiration for me. So. Um, We'll let you get some dinner there in Berchtesgaden. Enjoy the, the last beautiful sun rays on the Batsman. And um, I look forward to seeing you next time, David. Thanks again so much. My pleasure. Me too. Bye, Tony. When I started as a tour guide back in spring of 1994 in the little village of Berchtesgaden, I had not been working barely two weeks before uh, I was approached in the tours office of the Hotel General Walker, the American resort hotel located on the Obersalzburg mountain, uh, located just on the outskirts of Berchtesgaden. I was approached by a, another tour guide um, who had been working there for many years. Her name was Krista, she was a pro, and uh, she asked me if I had anything going on in the next hour because she had a German tour that she was taking down into the bunker system and because I had a background in German and, and spoke and, and uh, understood German fluently um, that she thought it would be of value to me to, uh, to join this tour uh, conducted by her down in the bunker system. So I, I joined her and we went down the steps 220 feet down underneath this historic hotel and uh, we were down then in the depths of this bunker system. This was an air raid shelter that had been constructed by the Nazi regime starting in August of 1943. And uh, in just a very short time, in less than two years, um, they actually dug out four and a half miles of underground tunnels in that mountain, connecting about 80 different rooms. So in essence, during World War II, they were moving the entire headquarters area underground. Well, I didn't know who this group of Germans were on this tour, but it didn't take long for me to realize that the leader of this group was an elderly man, was probably about 84 years old at the time. This is back in 1994. And uh, he obviously was the leader of the group. It was about six or seven Germans, all older and uh, they were all sort of huddled around him. Now, I was the only American in this group, so already I was an outsider, but I was there purely to observe and just to listen in. And uh, as it turns out, um, this guy was actually giving half the tour. Uh, when uh, Krista would mention something, he, he would say, yeah, well, I, I could add something, or maybe it was a, actually a little bit more like this. And uh, as it turns out, the gentleman who uh, she was giving the tour for was none other than Karl Wilhelm Krause. It was Hitler's butler and valet. Uh, Karl Wilhelm Krause was an SS Hauptsturmführer uh, in the SS, and he was uh, actually living in the Berkhof in Hitler's house for two years um, when he was about 22 years old. So, uh, I didn't know that at the time, but nonetheless, it was quite strange to 
listen to this man who obviously uh, was very, very close to Adolf Hitler. I mean, this was the guy who put Hitler's shoes in the right spot every morning and brought him his breakfast every day. And uh, I'm sure that Hitler was on a first name basis with this guy, you know, hey Carl, how you doing? Um, my Fuhrer, my Fuhrer. Anyway, uh, so it, it, was, it was a very, very strange, bizarre experience. And uh, again, throughout this whole tour, I had not, no idea who the guy was, but uh, at the end of the tour, then I was back in the tour's office and Krista had taken them out of the hotel and, uh, and said goodbye to them. And then she came back in the tour's office and uh, she just went about her business. And I looked at her and said, Krista, who was that? And just very nonchalantly, she said, oh, that was Carl Wilhelm Krause, that was Hitler's butler. Well, I'm mentioning this story to you because this was one of the first experiences I had when I moved to Berchtesgaden and started working as a tour guide there. And let me tell you something about history. You can read about it all day in a book. You can look at black and white pictures all day long but when you can reach out and touch the history, when you can feel it and walk on the ground and even in some cases smell the history, uh, it takes on a life of its own. It becomes much more real. And uh, this is another way, yet another way to connect with history. Um, we've talked about how breaking stories down, getting the personal side of the war, allows us to emotionally connect with history. Well, another way to connect is to visit the places where history was made. And in doing so, all kinds of things happen. And uh, so uh, this was one of the first experiences I had and uh, which led me to a, a 20 plus year career uh, in guiding groups to World War II sites throughout Europe and, and Russia. Needless to say, times were very rough during the Battle of the Bulge. Cold winter, the heavy German artillery fire. Art Peterson and Henry Beck didn't get a decent meal in days. They went out looking for some food. Looking across a the field, they noticed a barn and they saw some chickens running around. So they were like, hey, if there's chickens, there must be some eggs. They waited until the end of the day when it was getting a little bit dark and decided to make a run for the barn. Peterson had wrapped the gunny sack around his boots trying to get to keep his feet warm. So they get to the barn, Peterson goes inside and he finds like three, four eggs and puts it in his helmet. And back manages to grab a chicken and puts it in the gunny sack. They started to make their way back to the woods when they were spotted by the Germans. Germans fired an 88 millimeter round directly at the two Americans. It exploded nearby them, and the chickens went that way, the eggs went the other way, and both went flat on the bellies onto the ground. Then Beck started running, and Peterson noticed he was bleeding intensively, and he had his guts hanging out. So Pete tackled him, put the gunny sack, put it around his waist, put it, take, took off his belt, put it around the gunny sack to make it as tight as possible. He grabbed back by the feet and pulled him into the woods and he called for medics to come and pick up the wounded soldier. Art Peterson did not see Henry Beck again until 25 years after the war. At a reunion, they were talking, and suddenly, Beck walks in. He sees Peterson, he walks up to him, and he hugs him and he kisses him, and he says, well, thanks to you, I'm here, Pete. You saved my life. Hey, that is our show, uh, episode five. Uh, it's in the bag. We hope that you'll be back on the 22nd of July, everybody, that's where we'll have Reggie back. We'll be talking about Bastogne and the Battle of Bulge. 
Um, folks, we could use your support. Please visit our website, bunkerboys.com. Uh, subscribe to uh, our, our site, uh, give us a donation. Anything you can do really helps in allowing us to keep providing uh, these episodes to you, to continue to bring you World War II, and um, we will keep doing it. And uh, we certainly hope that you uh, will dig deep and uh, do whatever you can to, to help us out. We certainly could use your support. We hope you enjoyed watching everybody. America, stay safe. I salute you. 1944 and I'm knocking at the door Mademoiselle Elena We met by chance in the west of France She turned my world around I'm proud to fight for what is right Now we're off to dance I'm torn between the call to arms And the wonders of romance I dance all night and life is wild and thrilling Every word and every touch is exciting and fulfilling Each passing day I want to stay a little longer near her And every thought and every dream is filled with longing for her I'm lost in Helen's arms That's where I surrender That's where I belong Dans les bras de l'aile Is where I want to be Dans les bras de l'aile J'ai découvert la vie